So the next idea that we're going to layer in as we talk about momentum is the concept of impulse. So when a force acts on an object, the impulse that that force delivers to the object depends on two things, the magnitude and direction of the force and the time interval over which that force acts. So for a constant force, we can write out the equation that says that J, that's the letter we're going to use for the impulse, is equal to the force times the time interval delta t. And so again, like with any vector equation, what does this tell us? Well, the first thing it tells us is that the impulse is a vector quantity. So just like with, with any vector equation, we can break this up into a subsequent number of component equations. And again, since most of the problems that we're going to work in this class will be in a two-dimensional space, we will often break up this impulse equation into thinking about the, the x component of the impulse and the y component of the impulse. And again, that's just going to be equal to the x component of the force times our time interval or the y component of the force times the time interval. Since delta t is always going to be positive, the impulse that's delivered to an object by the individual force has to point in the same direction as the force. So that if your force points to the right, the impulse exerted by that object must also point to the right. So the impulse and the force, the force exerting that impulse have to point in the same direction. So that tells us about direction. What about the magnitude? Well, again, pretty easy to see that from the magnitude of the impulse, it depends on how strong the force is and how long it acts on the object. So again, the longer it acts, the, the stronger your force is, the larger the impulse would, will be. The longer that force acts, the larger your impulse will be. And if you want to think about the units of impulse, well, again, the units of impulse are going, are going to be equal to the units of force times the units of that time interval. Well, force has units of newtons. The time interval has units of seconds. So one way to write the units of impulse is just newton seconds. Of course, since a newton is kilogram meters per second squared, if I multiply newtons times seconds, it just cancels one of those seconds on the bottom. And so I'm left with kilogram meters per second. And that unit should look familiar because, because of course, that's the unit of momentum. So what if F isn't constant? So we, we sort of set up that equation in the context of having a constant force. What happens if our force isn't constant? Well, one way we can deal with it is we can think about some average force, and this is really the average force over time. So we have here a plot of force versus time, and you can see that the force itself is rather complicated, right? There's a couple of peaks, right? but it basically starts at some initial time ti and ends at some initial time tf. And I can, and so there's some complicated force that I can basically reduce to thinking about the average force that's going to give me the same area under the curve. So if you color in underneath the area underneath the force, even though it's complicated, that's going to give you some area. If the, what I'm going to do is define the average force that basically gives me the same area over that time interval. And the reason I want to do this is because that if it gives me the same area under the curve, then that means it's giving me the same impulse over that time interval. And so instead of worrying about all the complicated details that actually define that force, I can think about, well, what is that force doing on average over the time interval and get the same impulse? So this is what we'll often do even in a situation where the forces are complicated is say, well, instead of worrying about all that complication, what's the average force that's going to exert the same impulse on your object? So what if there are multiple forces acting on the object? Well, all I'm going to do is calculate the net impulse by doing the vector addition problem. So the net impulse is just the sum of all the individual impulses exerted on the object. So if I've got J1 plus J2 plus J3 plus however many other impulses are being exerted on the object, each by a different force, 
And so, of course, what I'm going to do then is say, well, all of those act over some time interval that happens to be the same. And again, I can think about that impulse as being equal to whatever that time interval is times each of those average forces. And so I'm left with basically factor out the delta T and I'm left with the net average force acting on the object times delta T. That's going to give me what the net impulse is. The nice thing about this is that, again, it's just a vector addition problem. So we know how to do vector addition problems, and that's really all this is. So calculating the net impulse, just like calculating the net force, it's just a vector addition problem. So what happens when you have some net average force that acts on an object over some duration of time? So basically when that net average force is not zero and you let it act over some chunk of time, then what ends up happening is you have a net impulse and that net impulse changes your object's momentum. So we'll come back and sort of set this up uh, a little bit more discreetly here in a minute when we talk when we explicitly tie in Newton's laws. But what we're basically doing is building what's known as the impulse momentum theorem here that tells us that the net impulse exerted on your object is equal to the object's change in momentum. And so this will be, again, one of the things that we'll do to help us think about how the forces acting on our object work to change its momentum.